Well, I'm so glad to have all of you here today. My name is David Diskin. I am the CEO, president, the, the guy that uh, with at least, at least a dozen other extremely dedicated volunteers help make Free Thought Day happen every year. This is going to be our 21st year. And uh, I don't know if you were uh, there for the last 20 or even the last two that we had online, but they're always a blast. And I'm going to tell you more about that at the end of tonight's presentation. But I do want to thank all of you for being here. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a Q&A button. If you have any questions during Allison's presentation, feel free to hit that Q&A button. We do have some time reserved for that this evening. And this is going to be recorded and will be shared online, streamed, whatever it is, on Facebook and our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, real quick, tonight's agenda. Uh, the bulk of the time is going to be for Allison to talk to us about the Secular California Report. Uh, you all know that, um, <laughs> Allison, this just, just even in the last 24 hours, uh, how quickly things change and happen and how much is influenced uh, by religion in not just our state, but in our country. So we're going to hear more about that, and then we'll address your questions. But I hope you'll stick around for just five minutes of announcements after Allison has gone through all of your questions. I want to talk to you about Secular Advocacy Week happening later this month and how you can be a part of that and help get your voice heard within California. I also want to talk just briefly about our main event later on in October and some scholarships announcements uh, that uh, you might want to pass on to others. Uh, so that's tonight's agenda. I promise you this will be done in under an hour. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Allison Gill. She is the Vice President of Legal and Policy at American Atheist. I'm so excited to have her talking uh, tonight with all of you. She manages federal and state policy, protecting the separation of church and state nationwide. But prior to her joining American Atheist, she also worked for Human Rights Campaign doing state level advocacy, which also is extremely admirable. And with that brief introduction, I'm gonna hand it over to Allison for the next, I don't know, half hour or so, whatever you've got. And again, remember, if you have questions, don't hesitate with that Q&A button. Allison, they're all yours. All right, thank you so much, David. And thank you for having me speak tonight. I'm really excited to speak with you all. I uh, added a few extra slides into my presentation tonight to discuss um, you know, some of the today's events and things that have been happening. So I'm going, I might cut some things towards the end if we tend if we look like we're going over. So just so you're aware, be aware this might be modified on the fly. Uh, let's see here. I'll just share my screen with you all. Uh, there it is. All right, how's that look, David? All right, I guess it's good. No it looks good. It look, I was already on right. it. It looks great. Perfect, perfect. Okay, great. So let's start. So I want to first um, talk with you a little bit about an introduction and then talk about the state of religious equality in California based on our research and the report we put out every year, the state of the secular states. And then I want to talk about the um, what has been happening around the country in state legislation and what has been happening in California and how they interrelate. So talking about some of the bills that, that are available there or that are happening in your legislature and how they, how they interact with state trends or national trends. And lastly, if there's time, I'll talk about a few advocacy tools and resources. So let's dive right in. I sometimes get asked, uh, why are we talking about these things? Um, things like you know abortion, things like uh, school censorship, um, various different aspects like uh, trans healthcare. Well, why are all these things atheist issues? Why, why are we talking about these? And it's a good question. I think it's worth addressing. So I'd like to start with that. So we live in a society where the religious forces of Christian nationalism are growing in power and more and more affecting our lives. So all the things atheists say that they care about, the separation of church and state, not being forced to live by the religious rules of others, science and rationality, they exist in the context of people's lives. They don't exist in a vacuum and are being impacted by the growing, um, you, know, you know, very conservative religious trends we have in this country. And so to defend our shared values, we have to push back against religious coercion and various different policy ideas as they, as they come up. So specifically looking at the issues we're discussing today, uh, we're talking about attacks on secular public education, we're talking about um, 
on attacks on access to healthcare that various religious groups want to block, uh, and, and these efforts to indoctrinate youth. And so how can we not see these as secular, as atheist issues when they directly relate to all of those, to those concerns? Also, I should mention that, you know, American Atheists did a survey in 2019 of about 34,000 non-religious people across the country. And we asked folks, what are, what issues do you think are most important for, you know, uh, secular organizations, national secular, secular organizations to focus on? What are your top priorities that they should focus on? And the top three were maintaining secular public, public schools, public education, opposing religious exemptions that allow for discrimination and access to abortion and contraception. So when we say these are atheist issues, you know, that's because we're reflecting what all the atheists we asked told us. Uh, we're reflecting our constituencies and what they actually want us to work on and what they think is important and important secular issues. So um, that's, I just wanna give that framing because I think it's helpful. So let's talk about California. So in every year, American Atheist publishes a state of the secular states report, which looks at uh, the laws and policies of every state and also DC and Puerto Rico. We look at about 50 different policy measures, um, both positive and negative, about how the laws uh, you know, support or undermine church state separation and religious equality. And so we published uh, this 2021 report in January of this year. And all of this information is available at atheist.org slash states. Um, there are about 50 different policy measures and they fully fall, fall in four broad categories, constitutional and non-discrimination protections, education and youth, healthcare and wellness, and special privileges for religion, like special religious exemptions, for example. So um, I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about, about what California's reports look like. So what are we tracking in this report? Well, first, uh, laws that impact religious equality, usually by providing special privileges based on religious belief, laws that affect the separation of religion and government, that harm ways that we can limit the harm that religion causes to third parties, especially children. And I think a really good example of that is stopping conversion therapy, which is um, usually a religious, but not always, efforts to convince LGBTQ children that they are in fact not LGBTQ, and it can have really devastating psychological impacts. It's usually driven by religion. So that's a good example of something we can do to prevent harm caused by religion and protect the civil rights of religious minorities and non-religious people. So states fall into three categories in the report, uh, strong protections for religious equality, which is blue, and there's 13 states and territories there, uh, sort of a middle level of basic separation, and the third, which unfortunately has the most states, uh, religious exemptions that undermine equality. So I'm very pleased to say California is in the blue category, as you might have guessed. Uh, it has very strong protections compared to most other states for religious equality and sure state separation. So we have a scorecard, which is available on the atheist.org. It's in the report itself, and it's also available on the atheist.org so as state's um, website. So the way we set these up is you can actually just go to the scorecard itself and download it. So you can just, and then print it off itself. So it's very easy to just pull the scorecard and that way you can use it, for example, when you're lobbying or for other purposes, or if you just wanna read it without having to go through like a hundred page report, um, it, it's a little bit more digestible this way. So this is a, an example from the website probably too small for you to read, but I'm going to go through and pick out some of the more interesting facts to talk about. But I will just say how to decode this, this uh, all these hieroglyphics here. So if it is a blue uh, icon, um, blue arrow, that usually means, I mean, it does mean it's a, it's a positive policy or a law or policy we consider positive. And if it's a red icon, then it's one we consider negative. So uh, if it's filled in, that means that the state has that policy. So if it's, uh, let's see, a state establishment clause, it's blue and filled in. So we think it's important for states to have an equivalent of their own establishment clause. And here, California does have one because it's filled in. And for example, California does not have religious tests for office because that is not filled in. And religious tests for office are bad. So there you go, easy to decipher. So I wanna talk a little bit about specific uh, California um, laws and policies. First of all, California has some of the strongest protections for church state separation 
and religious equality in the country. That being said, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but they are among the strongest um, in many areas. It has constitutional protections for free exercise and uh, to prevent religious establishment, just like the US Constitution. It is the only state that I'm aware of that has what it's called, what's called a statutory taxpayer standing. But basically it means that it's easier to get into court in, in California state courts to sue when there is, when the state's spending money on unconstitutional things. Like for example, if they were to put up a giant cross or something, it's easier to get access to California state uh, courts than it is in almost any other state because it's actually built into the statutes. It's codified as opposed to most other states where it's sort of judge made law, which is I think is a big positive. It's a little bit nebulous, but it's it's uh, hard to explain, I should say, but it's, it's a very positive thing. Um, it also has strong non-discrimination protections that cover religion in all sorts of different areas from employment to housing to uh, education. And these also include protections for non-religious people. So when you say there's non-discrimination protections based on religion, that includes lack of religion. There's also strong protections from religious-based harm, especially for youth. For example, there's um, uh, has a few pr protections for again for things like preventing female genital mutilation and conversion therapy. It's one of the few states without religious exemptions to school vaccination requirements. So most states require or allow um, basically people to opt out of state school vaccination requirements for religious reasons if they have a religious exemption. California is one of, I think, just five states that do not do that. So that's that's fantastic. And it's one of the, um, it has one of the strongest sex education requirements in the country. So it has strong requirements for making sure people receive appropriate education in school. Um, but there are some areas where there could be improvement. For example, it does not have a law against child marriage. There's actually no minimum age for marriage in California, which sounds ridiculous <laughs> when I say it. There's only about six states that have laws that prohibit completely child marriage. Some states set like a parameter, like you know, 16 or younger with like a judge sign off. California um, has the latter, but there's no minimum age at any point, <clears throat> which is uh, definitely should be improved. There's also a lack of protections to prevent child abuse or ensure adequate education for homeschooled children. And that's an area that we started watching much more closely after the beginning of the pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because more and more people were, you know, because of the school closures, were sort of homeschooling or using this opportunity to do more homeschooling. And it's just amazing how little protections there are in most states, unfortunately. And that's the same in, in California. Even though it has a very liberal reputation, there's still very few protections for uh, the children or to ensure they receive adequate education when it comes to homeschooling. There's also civil and criminal exemptions for child negligence laws for faith healing. So basically exemptions if a, if a tragedy happens and a child dies because they're not receiving adequate medical care, there's still exemptions in the law that allow that. Um, I think that's all I want to cover here. The categories on the scorecard are all sort of described in greater detail in the full report. So if you are interested in reading more about each of the categories and why we why we think they're important and get more detail on them, then it's all available in the full report at atheist.org slash states. So let's talk about what's been happening in California this past year in terms of legislation and also at the national level. So this year we've just seen an avalanche of negative bills, unfortunately, all across the country. Um, California has been spared the worst of the negative legislation in some states, Oklahoma, Missouri, for example, there have been dozens of terrible bills that seek to undermine true state separation or civil rights in a lot of different areas. This is not all the trends, but I want to just point out a few of them that we've been seeing. Um, public health religious exemptions, and I'll go into that what that means more in a, deep, in a few minutes. We've been seeing medical bans and athletic bans for trans young people. So that would either prevent them from accessing medical care. And in some cases, and this has made the news, you're probably aware of it, um, you know, actually criminalize families as, as for abuse for getting adequate medical care for, for trans young people. And also school athlete bans for trans youth. 
Um, there are school censorship and surveillance bills. This is a really broad category of bills. I'm going to talk about more in a minute, but it's what are sometimes called, um, you know, anti-CRT bills, critical race theory, which is, you know, a real misnomer. Sometimes these include things like don't say gay bills. So it's, it's kind of a broad category, and I'll talk about these more. There's also denial of care bills, which I'll mention, and bills limiting access to reproductive care. So I'm gonna go through a few of those national trends and talk about how they relate to California. Let's start with re religious refusals or denials of care. So we've seen this national trend beginning really in 2020 and also 2021, where we, we're just seeing very broad new bills be introduced that would allow denial of medical care by, by not only hospitals and providers, but by the first time for, by employers and even insurers if they do not accord with their um, religious beliefs, ethics, or morals. So it's this much broader type of denial of care law than we've seen previously. Now, denial of care laws exist in almost every state that allow basically doc an individual doctor who doesn't believe in abortion, for example, to opt out of it. And you know we don't love those, but they're not as broad as what we've been seeing this sort of modern wave of recently. Um, last year, they passed in both Arkansas and Ohio I'm pleased to say that none have actually passed this year, which is good news because we don't really know the full impact of these. They're very, it's very possible that these could be easily abused. I mean, they give insurance companies, just as a quick example, another excuse to opt out of paying for something because it's against their ethics or morals. And that's just a, sort of a flippant example, but these cover any, unlike other previous in the denial of care bills, these cover any uh, medical procedure potentially. So cancer treatment or, um, you know, really there's no limit. Um, and it, it can, you know, it's hard to understand the full impact this will actually have until we see them in operation just because they're so broad and, and absurd really. This is amplified by the problem that we're seeing all across the country, but definitely in states like California where there has been mergers between religious hospitals and secular ones. And these are sort of been increasing over time. And so often, you know, religious hospitals will acquire secular hospitals or they will work together with them and put them under contract. And either way, sometimes the secular hospitals or the new system has to comply with the religious hospitals rules. And this often is the case with uh, Catholic hospitals. And so that can limit access in places, even if the law would normally allow access, it, it can, increase uh, the will decrease the ability of people to get adequate care, especially around things like abortion, contraception, end of life care. And so that there has been some controversy about that in California. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because a couple of the bills I want to talk about that California considered this year are relevant to these issues. The first is AB 1204 which requires hospitals to submit annual reports on health equity. So this is not a direct solution to any of the problems I'm, I was talking about, but because of the hospital mergers issues, and one of the ways we can sort of uh, understand how that is affecting actual consumers is to have hospitals sort of report regularly on you know, how, the, how basically their services are impacting access to different types of healthcare and the, especially for vulnerable groups. And so that's what we call uh, health equity. And so that bill actually passed this year in California. Um, it requires annual reports, including efforts to reduce disparities among vulnerable populations by hospitals in California. So that's one way where um, basically the legislature can, can understand how hospitals are being affected, where mergers are taking place and are they actually reducing services? And if so, is that a way that they can then move forward and take additional steps to, to correct or address the issue? So it's not a solution, but it is a step in the right direction, if that makes sense. Another bill, uh, and I know David's going to flag this one later, is SB 523, which increases access to contraception. Now, this is a very uh, long and technical bill that has a lot of different uh, port proportion, portions to a lot of different components. And so I'm not going to go into everything, but it fills in a lot of holes and gaps when it comes to access to contraception under California law. Uh, for example, it provides access 
if an employer refuses to cover contraception. So if your employer refuses to cover contraception, and those are normally religious providers, you can still get access by going to the state and asking for access to contraception. It provide, requires plans to provide over-the-counter contraception without cost sharing. So all plans have to have over-the-counter contraception without cost sharing. Um, requires state employees and employees of the University of California to the, their plans to meet contraceptive minimums. So make sure that their plans, there's always access for employ, state employees as well. It includes contraception for men in the contraceptive minimums that are required. And for religious organizations, it helps ensure access in a couple of different ways. Um, basically, it says it, pro it provides access well, it prevents the religious organization from discriminating against someone because they were able to get contraception from a different place. Like if they went to the state for contraception because the the, the uh, religious organization refused to provide it and the, the person got contraception from the state, then they cannot be subject to discrimination by the religious provider. And also it requires um, coverage for non-contraceptive uses. And there's some, for example, um, some conditions that require contraceptive, something equivalent to contraception, but used for non-contraceptive uses to decrease symptoms from another underlying condition. So that's a number of the things the bill does. It's a little bit, um, like I said, complex, but it's a really important bill. And I know it's one that the California Free Thought Day will be doing their secular day of act, week of action on. Um, okay, my slides are a little bit out of order here. Give me a second. All right, here we go. The next trend I want to talk about is abortion restrictions and bans. And so we've just seen an increasing number of state anti-abortion bills over the last several years, especially since the elevation of Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett. They have just triggered these sort of waves of anti-abortion bills. And the Supreme Court, this was, I wrote this before uh, today's, uh, well, yesterday evening's announcement about the leak at the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health will play a really important role about whether these bills we're seeing pass all over the country can stand or not. Now, um, the, I'll talk about more about that case in a moment. I have a separate slide on it. But just know that these bills are passing in different places. The Mississippi one that was at issue there is actually one of the less restrictive ones. Some of them that are passing are much more restrictive. And you might have heard of the one in Texas called SB8, which is kind of a unique bill that operates in a different way than most of these other basically like 15 week restrictions, for example. It allows anybody to sue a, it gives them a private right of action to sue someone who um, provides abortion to or supports uh, providing abortion to a woman past six weeks of pregnancy. And so it basically, even though they're not directly affected, it gives outside people in Texas standing or an ability to, to sue. So it creates basically a lot of extra liability for um, uh, abortion clinics, for example, or for reproductive health clinics for like Planned Parenthood. And so basically they, um, it's very difficult to operate under that because they don't know if they're going to be subject to an avalanche of suits at any point. So because of that, it really does restrict people's access to abortion in real terms very, very quickly. And we've definitely seen that happen in Texas. So we were very concerned that we'd see a number of these all over the country. And there have been some, like for example, Oklahoma is, I'm not, I don't know if they've passed it or they're about to pass it, one that's limited, that's just like the Texas bill, except is at zero weeks instead of six weeks. So that's uh, an even more restrictive one. However, most of the anti-abortion bills we've been seeing around the country are actually more like the 15-week ban at issue in Mississippi. So I just want to talk a little bit about the Dobbs case, which is the Supreme Court case I just mentioned. So the state passed a 15-week abortion ban in Mississippi yesterday or evening there was a leaked draft decision. So we just wanna emphasize, this is not binding, it is a draft. We do not know ultimately what the decision will look like. We don't know why this was leaked. This is not typical. Uh, I've never heard of a leaked decision from the Supreme Court before. And uh, I think it's really kind of interesting and momentous. We don't know who leaks it or why. 
But it's important to just emphasize that abortion is currently still legal. Um, and even after this, if this came out exactly as it's written, it would still be legal in California. However, even in, uh, but it is very troubling. So if Roe v. Wade is overturned, there are currently 13 states which that have what are called trigger bans, meaning that if Roe v. Wade is overturned, they would immediately ban abortion in those states. So that's 13 states. Nine others have pre-Roe v. Wade bans that they never took off the books. Well, nine, nine states. So uh, together, that's about 18 states that would immediately uh, lose access to abortion if this if this decision and the leaked version came out tomorrow, for example. Now, we don't know what the final decision is actually gonna look like. It um, is likely to come out probably in June. We don't know that, but you know, it's hard to say at this point, but it is very distressing and um, you know, very worrisome for the future of abortion access in this country. Uh, if the decision comes out like it looks like today, then other states would be free to pass whatever restrictions or bans that they want to do as well. If the decision comes out and it looks more like, um, you know, a more narrow decision saying, well, the Mississippi ban, uh, 15 week ac uh, access ban is, is okay, but they're not gonna go further than that, then, then it would be um, more of a close call. Some of these laws might stand up and some might be struck down. But as it's written, this is a very broad uh, draft leaked opinion. So let me just show you a map of what that looks like. The states in red are the 18 states that would immediately lose access to abortion based on those. So let's talk about California's response. California has a bill called AB uh, 1666, which denies access to California courts to a person or entity that seeks to enforce another state's anti abortion law. So basically, if you get a, this is most pertains to, um, uh, you know, bills like Texas's SB8. If they tried to get a judgment against somebody and then apply it in California through the California courts to actually collect it, they would be unable to. Uh, but there could be other circumstances as well as to protect from other types of liability based on other states' anti abortion laws for people in California. This has not yet passed. It did make it uh, through committee. And so it's currently in the assembly awaiting for a vote in California, but it's meant to protect California residents and people living there from other states, the reach of other states anti-abortion laws. So given this news, uh, maybe they'll be more likely to take it up and move forward with it, which would, be, which would be great. And I know this is one of the bills that is going to be part of the secular day of action. So there's plenty of reason that we should be pushing forward and talking about it. Okay. Another national trend I wanted to talk about was censorship and surveillance bills. And so this is a range of bills that are attacks on secular public education, including um, so-called critical race theory bans, parental rights bills, don't say gay bills. It's sort of a diverse category because these bills are all a little bit nebulous and the they're more about legislating subtext and the actual language of the bill because it's about how the bill is going to be applied more than like the direct language, which is what can be a bit confusing. Um, the goal is censorship of disfavored topics, which is achieved through intimidation of educators and undermining support for public education. And where these bills have passed, I mean, we see how they're applied. There have been massive book bans in Texas, for example. Um, I think the, uh, the sponsor of the bill in Texas I think passed around a list of over 800 books in different places and then basically libraries and uh, schools in different, different districts have been working to pull out more than 800 possible books uh, from schools in Texas. Uh, I won't go into detail here because I think that this is probably pretty well known, but this includes things like these bills often include elements like the don't say gay provisions that have been pretty um, prominent from the Florida bill opting out, uh, allowing parents to opt their children out of any classes or coursework based on their religious beliefs, mandatory disclosure of materials to parents in onerous ways, and allowing for challenges of, by parents of materials in the school classroom, harsh penalties to educators, sometimes even a, a right to sue educators, um, religious exemptions to vaccination and other safety precautions, 
forced outing of LGBTQ students and, um, you know, like I already mentioned, the prohibition on discussion of LGBTQ topics and people, uh, prohibition of data collection, which is frustrating for data nerds like me. Um, so a whole bunch of different issues uh, are sort of crammed into these grievance bills. And I want to talk about California. So California has long had the Fair Education Act since 2011, which requires inclusion of diverse groups in K-12 history and social studies. And um, it includes different cultures, race and ethnicity, men and women, LGBTQ people, and people with disabilities. So it's one of the, the broadest, most inclusive laws in the country when it comes to education. So California almost has the exact opposite of what one of these uh, school censorship bills is. They require people to sort of have diversity in education. Um, and one of the bills that I know uh, David mentioned that you guys are going to be focusing on for Secular Day of Action or Week of Action is ACA 6, which is a constitutional amendment that increases school time on history and culture for California Native Americans and requires the Department of Public Education to provide educational materials uh, that are suitable for those types of classes. So I'm sure you'll get more information on that, but I want to flag that because I think it is a good example of being more inclusive instead of less inclusive, like uh, some of these other states are trying to be. Um, so. And the last trend I wanted to highlight was the religious exemptions to public health. Um, so we've seen at the beginning of the pandemic, almost every state had public health emergency orders that caused closures of uh, public gatherings um, and, and schools, for example. And that um, most of those have long since expired. However, there was a lot of legal challenges around those because sometimes they affected churches and churches felt like they should have some churches, very few actually, but some churches felt like they should have a religious right to be open and be immune from you know, public health restrictions. So um, that had some traction at the Supreme Court, unfortunately. But besides that, putting that aside, uh, many states have begun to consider bills that basically exempt uh, religious organizations from these public health restrictions in some or all cases. And there's a whole range of what these look like. They differ quite a lot in different states. Um, sometimes these are this idea that we need um, religious exemptions to allow churches to meet or that religious um, freedom is being impinged upon because of the pandemic has allowed lawmakers, conservative lawmakers, to sort of push through even broader religious exemptions that don't actually relate to the pandemic in any way. Uh, so that's, we've seen that in a number of different states, including, for example, in Arizona nearby, or basically they just, and also uh, I think it was Montana, for example, they justify these really, really broad religious exemption laws based on saying, well, we need exemptions to allow churches to meet, even though the bill goes far beyond that. Uh, let's see. So a lot of these are have what it create a function by creating what I call a false equivalency between religious and secular organizations. Basically, they exempt religious groups from emergency orders unless they apply to every secular organization. Um, so they're trying to say that religious groups should be treated like secular groups, but that's not how the language actually is written. It's written so that unless uh, restrictions apply to every secular organization, that they can't apply to religious organizations. So it's a false equivalency because usually there's got to be some, at least some secular organizations that, that exemptions or that restrictions might not apply to. And let me give you some examples. Hospitals are probably going to be treated differently than, um, I don't know, grocery stores, which are gonna be treated differently than wine stores, for example. Those are all secular organizations, but they all have different rules on them. And so uh, it's unclear in those circumstances what can be applied to religious organizations because are they, are they subject to only what's applicable to hospitals? Because those are two very different institutions. Um, uh, another example is, for example, uh, 
police stations, which are, again, have to be open and they're subject to different restrictions and rules than either hospitals or grocery stores. So my point is that there's always, there's different circumstances and therefore applying a one size fits all rule is never going to be the case. There's always going to be different options based on the needs that happen during a uh, public emergency order. And so saying that religious organizations have to be uh, free of them unless they apply to everybody, it's just never going to work. It's just going to opt out and exempt religious organizations. So what we saw in California, and this is the only bad bill on the list for California actually, is um, religious exemption. There was a bill called uh, the Religion is Essential Act which I'm not making that up. That's what it's called, the Religion is Essential Act. It says that religious services are declared an essential service during states of emergency. However, they define uh, religious services incredibly broadly to include um, any meeting, gathering, or assembly of two or more people organized by a religious organization for the purpose of worship, teaching, training, education, conducting faith rituals, or any other activity that's deemed necessary by the religious organization. So you can tell that's very, very broad. Any other activity deemed necessary by the religious organization is pretty much unlimited. Um, and states could impose limitations only if they are applicable to all organizations and businesses that provide essential services. So again, I was just talking about this. It sets up a false equivalency. You cannot restrict these unless they apply to everybody else. And there's no rules that apply to everybody else. Um, it also imposes a strict scrutiny test on required, imposes a strict scrutiny test on government requirements for health and safety regulation of religious organizations. I, I won't go into that in detail except to say a strict scrutiny test is very difficult burden to meet on government action. So it may be difficult for government to affect them at all uh, in terms of health and safety regulation. And that provision is not even clear, it only applies during emergency orders that that the way it's framed and written in the bill, it, that could be all the time. So just a complete sort of making it more, it, it's sort of a backdoor way to pass a Religious Freedom Restoration Act in California that applies to religious organizations. Uh, so I just wanna flag this. This bill fortunately is dead. It's not going anywhere, uh, but it did get more traction than I thought it would. It did actually get a hearing in California and uh, move forward. I think it even passed out of committee but it did die, fortunately. It's just to show you some of the bills that we're seeing do actually affect you all <laughs> in your state. So let me just recap those bills for you. Um, SB 397 is the Religion is Essential Act, which is dead. And there are the other ones I have just been speaking about. I know uh, David is going to be talking more about the Secular Week of Action. And some of three of these bills, I think, I believe are part of that uh, effort. Um, let's see, David, how am I doing on time? Maybe I'll stop and take questions at this stage. Uh, if you'd like to, yeah, we've got about maybe 10, 11 minutes left, uh, including your Q&A. Um, yeah, okay, let's do that then. That sounds perfect. All right, cool. Uh, so let me start here. Uh, by the way, just so many great questions. Um, the first one is uh, just more of a statement. I just want to shout out to Catherine for suggesting this, that we need to work with other organizations that we're already a part of, uh, like NOW and NARAL. Uh, if you're a president of the chapter, if you are a volunteer for the chapter, um, make sure that you are doing what you can with those connections to advance these issues that you know certainly are important to us. Uh, Tom, uh, who, by the way, I just want to give a shout out to Tom for being one of the founding members of the Secular Coalition for California, asks if there's a list of all the bills in California that are problematic. And Allison, I know you just gave us uh, maybe two or three, but um, without going to literally the thousands of bills that are on the state website, is there something, and looks like you've got a slide for that. Yeah, I skipped these, uh, I guess I shouldn't have, but yes, we track state bills in every state uh, right there, atheist.org slash activism state legislation. So um, we track bills across the country and in California, there's not all that many negative bills we're tracking in California. I mentioned the only negative one we're tracking there. If we are missing any bills, and you want us to flag them for a tracker, there's a little button you can press on that page and let us know. 
And we really do rely on people across the country. You know, when you're seeing it, it we track thousands of bills, <laughs> tens of thousands of bills, really. And so did, some definitely fall through the cracks. And that's why if you do see negative bills that we should be paying attention to, it's a great idea just to press that button and let us know. Um, but yeah, we try to keep it all in one place so it's easy to access it. That's awesome. Uh, speaking of just working with other organizations, uh, does American Atheists uh, work with organizations like the ACLU? Can you speak for just a, a few seconds on that? Absolutely, yes. We work at the, with a, a huge number of organizations at the federal level. We're, not, we're part of a number of uh, coalitions focusing, for example, on LGBTQ rights, um, on repro issues, on things like ending child marriage. Uh, a whole host of different issues. So we have all these national relationships and then we also work together in different states. So we uh, are part of coalitions, for example, that focus on stopping negative legislation all across the country, um, especially, uh, for example, LGBT, negative anti-LGBT legislation. Um, but awesome. we can also okay. connect you folks with sometimes, I mean, if there is an if there's an interest in developing better connections with groups in your state, that's something we might be able to help with uh, in different places. Um, I, I haven't really mentioned the California State Advocacy Team much, but we uh, have been working with um, Atheist United and other California advocates to build a group of grassroots advocates in California and to support them uh, and connect them with local groups and help to build support for passing positive legislation. So that's another avenue by which we can build these connections. Are you seeing the ACLU helping you with some of these discriminatory laws? Yes, they're fantastic. We work with them all across the country in different states um, to oppose some of these bills. It's interesting. I've always had an interesting relationship with the ACLU because they are uh, the, each each individual chapter is, um, how should I say, it? they're independent of the national, so they, they don't always take the same positions on things, <laughs> and, and sometimes um, they don't agree with, like, for example, us or whatever groups on their issues. Like when I, I used to work for GLSEN, the Gay Lives Ministry Education Network, and I uh, focused on anti-bullying work. And for a while, it was really tricky dealing with the ACLU because they were concerned about the free speech implications of anti-bullying laws. And later, when I was at the Trevor Project working on laws to prevent conversion therapy, there was a lot of concern with the ACLU in different states about uh, anti-conversion therapy bills. And just recently, uh, we've been having some concerns about, for example, bills about ending child marriage. And for example, the California ACLU has been a real opponent there. Uh, so they're not always on the same side, but often they are. All right. Um, I had a couple of questions about money and religion. Um, some came up about the Johnson Amendment uh, or even what can California do? So one question is, can California do anything about uh, religious tax exemptions or religion, you know, institutions that are um, that enjoy tax exemptions? Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, what about the pensions that uh, some religious organizations have? They're exempt from ERISA requirements. Is there anything that we can do in California? And do you see anything happening uh, federally on those issues? Sure. I don't see anything happening federally. However, almost every state has some um, religious uh, exemptions that relate to their taxation laws. And they can be, uh, actually, this is something that we look at in the um, State of the Secular Stage Report, we look at, for example, let me just pull it over here so I can give you a real example instead of trying to make something up. Um, in California, we looked at, uh, is there se separate limited or easier filing requirements for religious organizations? They don't they, they not have to file, meet the filing, filing requirements that other nonprofits have to meet. Are there what's called parsonage exemptions? So there's special exemptions for priests who get um, a place to live from the the uh, the parish or church. Are there property tax exemptions that differ from other nonprofits? And are there sales tax exemptions that differ from other nonprofits? And so California has some of these, and it could certainly pass, you know, make changes to its code about taxation. I'm not aware of any efforts in the state right now to make those changes, but it is certainly something that could be done to improve the state of law in California. Thank you for that. Uh, here's a scary question. If the 
uh, if a party gains majority in Congress, I'm guessing they mean like, you know, 60, 66, whatever, out of the 100, what is the likelihood that they could pass a federal law that completely bans abortion in all 50 states? Could they do it if they got uh, a full majority, a strong majority? Uh, well, I'm assuming that the, our current president would probably veto that. So they would need a, a two thirds majority in both chambers, which seems unlikely. Um, but if they had the votes for it, then, I mean, assuming, I guess this is in a post Roe v. Wade world, right? If we're talking about if this leak decision came down and um, it, it basically said that Roe v. Wade was no longer the law of the land and they had that high level of support, then yes, it could actually happen, okay. I think. Yeah, <laughs> scary. Um, yeah, it's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, hypotheticals there. So <laughs> right. we're well, not I, in that I, world. Uh, Hopefully I guess the flip of that is that if we had enough people who were uh, pro-abortion rights, that they could pass something federally that would protect that right, right? That is exactly right. And we support a bill called the Women's Health Protection Act at the federal level. It was actually passed by the House this year, and or it might have been last year. But anyway, it was passed by the House. And what it uh, does is it basically says um, it guarantees federal access to uh, reproductive you know, federal reproductive access so we, people can get services that they need. And that has not been unfortunately taken up by the Senate, but it was, um, it is something that's in the works. All right. Uh, here's a question hypothetically about the, um, the bill that we have potentially in California that would protect the rights of somebody who came to California seeking an abortion. And I, I think I'll um, summarize the question is, it, it, once they go back to their state, let's say they were from Texas or Mississippi, um, could that state further, could that state charge them with something like murder of the fetus once they return after getting that abortion here in California? Conceivably, yes, but they'd have to prove it, right? And okay. um, they'd have to prove it. So let's think about some of the difficulties there. If the California courts aren't cooperative with like getting, um, you know, I mean, medical records, medical records, those sorts of things, then it would be more challenging to prove it. But still they, uh, yes, they, I, I mean, if a person lives in a state, they have to follow the state law, uh, even if it's terrible. So yeah, there's not much California could do for that person who went back to Arkansas or wherever. Even if the quote crime happened in another state they could still be held liable when they return to their home state? It's certainly possible. I mean, I think we're in a real a whole new world when it comes to law in this area. So it's hard for me to, to sort of say anything with a complete certainty, but that seems very likely, yes. And, and like I said, they would have to prove it. Well, that is frightening. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, it's uh, very frightening. Today's decision, uh, not decision, leaked opinion was very shocking, honestly. Seriously. All right. Well, Allison, I want to just thank you so much for answering all these questions and all the research and everything that you have done to make tonight happen. Don't leave yet for everybody that's uh, just about ready to, 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 to step out. Just give me five more minutes. You've heard Allison talk about a couple of the bills that we are particularly interested in here in California that are currently pending in our state legislation. Uh, I would invite all of you to please join us this month on May 11th and then any time during the week of May 23rd through 27th. We're going to have a free orientation on May 11th to help you learn how to advocate for three of the bills that Allison was talking about tonight. And then we're gonna set you and others, uh, pair you up with others in your district to go talk to your elected officials. Whether you wanna do that online or in person, that's completely up to you. You heard about uh, Assembly Bill 1666, which will help give additional rights to those who come to California seeking an abortion. You heard about State, or sorry, Senate Bill 523, which will provide additional access to contraception and other healthcare related uh, advantages, not just to state employees, but also to uh, college students that are going through the UC and state system. And then on the topic of education, uh, constitutional amendment number six, which would increase awareness of uh, our uh, native Californians and make it a requirement that we teach more about their contributions to the state. Again, all of that happens this month because they're going to be making decisions very soon. 
uh, we want to get our voice heard with them. You can learn more about all of this at our website at freethoughtday.org. Again, this is completely free, just another thing that we do at California Free Thought Day. Speaking of other things that we do, uh, we have a uh, $2,000 available in scholarships. And I uh, don't know if any of you watching are currently in high school or college, or maybe you know somebody who is. But we just opened up uh, these two programs, and one of them closes at the end of July, the other one at the end of September. So you can learn more about how anybody in California, uh, high school or a college student anywhere in the country can uh, take a piece of that pie and apply that to their, uh, to, their, to, their, to their college. So please enter our contests today. Also, this Thursday is the Sacramento Big Day of Giving. Uh, it's something that happens here to support all of our local and regional nonprofit organizations in Sacramento or California Free Thought Day is certainly part of that. Any donation that you can give us during the Big Day of Giving supports those scholarships, secular advocacy events like this one, our civic engagement, and of course our big event that happens October of every year. You can donate now or anytime up until 11 o'clock p.m. this Thursday. The link is on our website. And to wrap up, California's 21st annual California Free Thought Day is happening this Sunday, October 9th. Sorry, this year, Sunday, October 9th. It's going to be at the California State Capitol, barring any new pandemic. And of course, on Zoom and Facebook and YouTube and all across the internet. Please follow us at Free Thought Day for announcements about our speakers, our live entertainment, our authors and podcasters panel, and all the great things that we have planned. Please mark your calendar now for Sunday, October 9, or even the night before when we have our fundraising reception. Outside of that, you can visit our website, freethoughtday.org, to learn about all kinds of other things that we have going on. You can follow us on all major social media platforms at freethoughtday.org. I want to thank American Atheists for tonight, especially Allison Gill. Thank you so much. And Sam McGuire, shout out to you uh, for making this connection happen the National Field Director. Uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors and donors and all of you for attending. Please go back, do, go to our website and learn what you can do this month about Secular Advocacy Week. And if you have any other unanswered questions, I'm going to do my best to get them answered for you and post them on our website and through social media. Allison and everyone else, thank you so much again for being a part of this. I hope you have a great evening and I hope to see you all in October. Thank you so much.